Hey, it's Alfie Williams. And Rodney McGee. And this is Rodney and Alfie Talk Metal. So first off, Rodney, a bit of a casual, a casual way to break in the conversation, which I haven't alluded to, so this is going to take you away off guard. Oh, no. I had a dream. I had a dream about... Oh, this never ends well. <laughs> I think I think we've got to a new level in our our relationship where I was having a dream about babysitting your cat. Okay. And then your cat bit me on the arm. Oh, that's reasonable. And then I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, uh, that that was a true thing. I I I dreamt about it last Tuesday, um, and I've been holding on to it for a week now. So yeah, I, I'm dreaming about you now, you and your cat. So yeah. Uh... <laughs> I'm going to look for an angle where none of that's disturbing. And I don't think I'm going to find it quickly as the cat stands up here. <laughs> you have recently come back from Iraq. I mean, Los Angeles. True. And you told me you've been playing Fortunate Son on repeat. So that can only mean one thing that you've come back from Nam. This is true. <laughs> Would you like to, 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 well, I don't know what the best way to do this is. How, I guess the, the first question is, how was it? Did you enjoy it? Uh, the show was great. Uh, Los Angeles is a burned out post-apocalyptic and dystopic hellscape. Uh, but other than that, it's great. Uh, <laughs> but no, the, the show was, it was really interesting. And you're going to hear a lot of conflicting reports about it. Um on you know of course social media and forums and things and i'm going to go ahead and not that i ever do this but call bullshit on a bunch of people <laughs> a lot of people were really slamming it because uh the big boys weren't there fender gibson prs you know all these type of things and the only thing i can say about that is good mm. and i'll get into why in a minute uh there's if you haven't been to NAM, it's usually about five convention halls wide and then another separate building that has a, a, another full thing of exhibits. And then there's also a basement level plus an upstairs thing, but that, uh, you know, it's fewer booths up there. And that's usually where the big boys are. Uh, it's kind of, it's so funny. It really is like this class system built into yeah. <laughs> the levels. It's like if you don't have much money, you're on the bottom level. If you're doing okay, you're at the mid level. And then if you're in the strata of Gibson, you're mm -hmm. up on the top level, you know. Uh, but n minimal top level, like ESP was up there, Yamaha, things like that. Uh, and there was no basement level. And there's usually halls A, B, C, and D. And they closed off D completely. Uh, so it, it was much smaller. But it, it was more like, I, I look at it less as it was smaller than it cut off a lot of crap. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't need to go to Fender's booth. I mean, that, what are you innovating? Mm. How, you know, what buyers have not heard of you? Yeah. You know, this is supposed to be an industry meeting where, you know, people go to, you know, place orders and see the new gear and see all of that. And it's like, is anybody not aware of Fender? <laughs> is this stuff you can't normally see or get your hands on? Then, uh, you know, same with Gibson. Say, you know, it's, I, I don't get why these companies are there half the time. But the reason you're going to hear a lot of complaining about it is, there's a lot of people who show up at these shows and they're what I call the tourists. Yeah. They really have no goddamn business being there. All they do is choke everything up and make everybody miserable because they look at it like a giant guitar center. Mm -hmm. I want to try out gear. I want to play with the new toys. I want to do this. No, all you're doing is interrupting conversations, making it miserable for actual artists to talk with their endorsers, things like that raising the noise level to just ear shattering levels and being a pain in the ass sitting there trying to play, you know, your new Jeff Loomis lick for the 4,000th <laughs> time over a 40 minute period on this base that everybody else is waiting for you to get the hell out of the way so they can take a look at it. And 
it, it those people are the ones I hear complaining the most. Oh, it was smaller. Didn't have this. Didn't have that. Yeah, you know what else it didn't have? A need for you, <laughs> and that's great. Uh, but every dealer that I talked to, it was mostly you know mid and lower mid guys. All of them said it was the best year they had had. Okay. Uh, I talked to like, uh, I have an endorsement with a company called tsunami cables. Uh, and the guy was like, I talked with more buyers and dealers than ever. Like they were coming and approaching me. I wasn't hunting them down. And he said, I sold more product this show, this supposed terrible show <laughs> than I have in the past five years combined. How is that possible? Yeah. Oh my God. You mean it didn't suck ass and that there's something there that the reason you're actually there was served by this. I, I can't believe it. What happened? Uh, you, you know, it does well when, you know, the guy comes over and we all took like an endorser's photo of, you know, the guys in there and he's like, I'm taking you guys all out to dinner, man. I, I cleaned it <laughs> up and he, he paid for dinner for like 18 people. Oh my God. And, uh, cause he was like, Hey man, you know, you guys were here and, I, I did better than ever. So great. Uh, so, you know, I, I kept hearing that from other people, a number of different companies. Everybody was like, man, I can't believe how much interest. Yeah, it's because they don't have to cut through the bullshit. Mm. Your, your booth isn't flooded with jackasses and tire kicker kids that are getting in the way of them actually feeling comfortable to sit and talk with you. Uh, there was, uh, I talked with, uh, one of the guys at two notes and, you know, they make really interesting stuff. We're going to talk a little further. And f on three occasions, I would just walk over to their booth and go to talk to them. And we would talk for like 15, 20 minutes, just hanging there. That's unheard of at a NAM show. You get like three minutes in and some other person is assaulting you or interrupting the conversation or something. I just hung out and talked. You know, talked about where he went to school for engineering and what he's doing with, uh, you know, touring and how he got hired at Two Notes. It just, you know, you could actually meet and develop relationships. And so for everybody, you know, on the floor, uh, everybody who, it, it, there became this weird flex this year, especially on social media about like, I'm not going to NAM. <laughs> You know, like it was some kind like, you know, I'm so edgy. I don't have to be in. This is going to be crap. Well, you lost out. And you know what? Good. I'm glad you stayed home because we didn't need you. Y you had no purpose of being there. And I thought it was a great show. Um, Who is saying that it was it was a bad show? Like the news? No, a lot of forum talk. A lot of okay. guys who, you know, said that they went and you know went to see all the new gear and stuff they're like oh it was so small it was so this yeah it's not guitar center it's not a candy store for you <laughs> go away you know absolutely ridiculous that kind of makes sense to me in in a way that this is the the behavior that i would expect on forums and stuff in social media um where's it gonna go with this <sighs> We, we kind of touched on this conversation before you went to NAM, and I wondered what place these big convention exhibits have in today's society. Like, um, and it sort of goes back to the original, um, it goes back to the original function of NAM, where it was a, I can't remember the right word, it, it's sort of like not a buyer's convention, but the, the, the wheelers and dealers and the people making the deals and getting things moving rather than the, the tire kickers like you alluded to. So it sounds like it's more of what it was supposed to be anyway. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, that's what I mean. It was just like, great. You know, it's buyers being able to meet with companies they don't have connections with that don't have the same reach or awareness and see new things. And then maybe that's something they want to distribute. What fucking new stuff does, you know, Gibson have to offer? Like, and not only that, but it's like, you're not innovating anything. Your orders mm -hmm. are going to be the same as last year. It's like, oh, we have a Les Paul in a slightly different 
red. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, do this shit over the phone. But, uh, yeah, it, I thought it was a good show, and I found it interesting that some of the, the trends I've been uh, thinking I've been seeing were kind of validated. Uh, I would say overwhelmingly, at least as far as guitar, you know, string instrument stuff goes, man, pedals owned it. There, yeah. There was more pedal, uh, small amp, mini stuff, everything like that. There was, if I had to give it by ratio, I would go like 30% Thirty thirty five percent instruments, uh, probably about forty five percent pedals, and then the rest being, and I thought this was noticeably interesting too, not amps but cabinets. Uh, okay, and then you know miscellaneous type of gear, but that struck me too because it was like. Almost, I'm seeing that response to pedal board based stuff too. In that, I saw uh, the two major amp things I saw were ones that were just selling cabinets. Wish. They, they weren't selling amps. So it's like, you know, it, because people just aren't dragging around the tube amps. So they're making just cabinets that people are hooking up their, you know, uh, their axe effects or Kemper or they're putting their floorboard into it. So they're not like amp makers aren't making cabinets. Cabinets mm -hmm. is becoming a thing unto itself. Uh, so that I found real interesting too. I didn't see, I only saw one amp builder that I really recognized and it was, <laughs> it was small. Mezzabarba was there, mm -hmm. but yeah, outside of that. Uh, oh, and Blackstar give them that but even they were there because they, they have these mini heads now right it's supposed to be the lightest heads in the industry which i will be reviewing on my channel and i actually very cool sitting back here nice but <laughs> you know they have usb interfaces and direct outs and all this stuff so they're very mini and they had cabinets but they were designed around the same thing of like you can pick one up in each hand and walk off with them so uh you know, it was only companies doing something that was basically modular or, yeah. you know, was going to be a smaller version of something. But, you know, Fortin amps, Rhodes, you know, all these kind of mid-level semi-boutique amps, none of them were there except Mezzabarba. And then you have Black Star, and that was about it. Uh, um, I'm in two minds about the, the big names showing up. It kind of feels like they decided, well, it's hard to say, but from my perspective, they decided this is not worth our time. It doesn't move our numbers. We would gain nothing from it. Um, and I think, like you said, like people are aware of these players anyway, like everyone knows Fender and Gibson. Um, but it's interesting. They don't want to be part of it. You think they would at least stake their claim in the industry. Um, in terms of, the trends and stuff i'm very surprised about cabinets because i don't know what it's like in the u.s with opening up from covid um but we've spoken in the past about cabinets and rigs shrinking down and doing away with cabinets because they're expensive they're cumbersome they're hard to transport and now if you can get away with using some sort of digital rig like a fly rig or the campers and the axe effects you don't need all of these cabinets so I'm very surprised, like, like, would you call that like a flagship product? Like a, these, these amplifiers, these, these cabinets you've seen? Yeah. Um, I kind of look at it in the way of, I don't think we're really going to liberate from cabinets completely for qu quite a long time. Uh, for one simple thing is that you know, the overwhelming majority of musicians aren't playing places that are large enough and have a staff good enough to do uh, really quality monitoring. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, most bands are playing clubs, couple hundred people, that type of thing. You don't have wedges all the way no. across with a, you know, a consistent mix with 
you know, that you can hear your guitar wherever you are, that type of thing. It, it's just not a reality. If you're using in-ears, maybe, but that's mm -hmm. still a ways off for a lot of bands too. If you're doing the average, you know, club gig or something, you know, that's, that's a, you know, a necessity of, it's basically a, you have to bring your own monitor. And so until technology breaks to the point where that problem gets solved, that in-ears just become the absolute standard or smaller venues just have some kind of automatic monitoring system that you can, you know, self-adjust or something like that. Mm -hmm. Cabinets are a necessity. Yeah. You know, it just, it comes down to that. Mm, I see. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, I just kind of had it in my head that a bit like how the way cars are going they're they're just big cumbersome polluting things. And mm -hmm. it's all about slimming down. I don't know. I think, Maybe it's just a generalization on our culture at the moment. It's all about trying to reduce, 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 reduce. And these big, heavy cabinets are a symptom of the old life of, you know, big, boisterous things. Um, also touching on pedals and modular stuff, that doesn't really surprise me. It feels like the bar to entry is much lower for manufacturers, manufacturing and design. Uh, anyone can spend 20 to $60 on a pedal and not really feel that pinch. If you're, if you're laying out for a bass, you're talking hundreds oh, of dollars. I don't know what pedal you're getting for 60 bucks. <laughs> uh, the Amazon ones. Ah, oh, those aren't pedals. Those are uh, the toys, but yeah. they're, they're still functional. Well. Two, okay, <laughs> there, there are there are there's a gradient in there. Yeah, of course sure. there is. But if you're if you're a young person and you don't want to spend, you know, three or four hundred dollars on a pedal, you can buy something similar on Amazon that does the job. No, it's not identical, but it's it's getting you a step in that direction. A chorus, a distortion, delay. They're functional. Um, we can split hairs on like how how much better the sound is and that sort of thing, but. You know, for twenty dollars, thirty, whatever, you have a, an easy entry, a, a easy entry to market. So I'm not surprised that there's, you know, a flood of pedals. Um, what what were the sort of build qualities like? Were they really expensive or were they cheap? Uh, let's see. It, there there was a variety there. Uh, like the the two most no, uh, two biggest ones are ones that stood out was there was a company called Arachnid Cabinets mm -hmm. and there was another company called Crunch. Crunch, I like that. Uh, and let's see, I would say that from my perception and not putting a, you know another company down, Arachnid seemed to be very much more specialized. Mm -hmm. Like they were really going after like the best cab you're going to get type of thing like uh all hand done you know things put together a lot of uh a lot of attention to detail on the cosmetics and the aesthetic of it and that the you know again the build quality is uh built to you know take a hit from a tank uh crunch seemed like a bit more like working man's mm -hmm. kind of thing from what i could see which nothing wrong with that, but they, they would be like a, a competitor more in the Marshall Mesa type of Avenue. Whereas Arachnid would be a competitor more on high end type of boutique cabinets. So, you know, there was, there, there's variance there. Uh, from what I heard from crunch, they, you know, not putting them down either. They had uh, like armored saint, their guitar players were over there playing uh and arachnid had uh he didn't play but gary holt from slayer and exodus showed up to do a signing and stuff so you know quality people using both of the things but you know yeah. like i said there are shades of it i i kind of find that more admirable and i think there might be a better place for those sorts of products in the market where if you're building something build it to the best, I guess it's sort of in the boutique range, build it to the best of your ability for quality and, and to make 
a, a good quality product. There's so much crap at the bottom, just trash in terms of cheap copies, cheap Chinese made stuff that's just imported in. And, and like I said, there is a place if you're a beginner for those sorts of things, maybe, but they really get in the way of, they get in the way of what you're looking for when you're trying to level up for lack of a better word. You, you know, you keep finding these, I'm just going to say, I guess I'll call it out the Chinese pedals that are everywhere on Amazon or wherever else. Like I'm looking for something that's a bit more, maybe specialized, but mm -hmm. at, a, at a lower price point. And, and you can't really find those when you've got these Chinese pedals coming in and you know, they're knocking off tech 21 and that sort of thing. So it's nice to see the complete opposite saying, fuck that. We're not going to make it cheap. We're going to go the best we can make it. And it's going to be the best. Take it or leave it. And if you want that cheap stuff, take the cheap stuff, but we're making the best. And I like that. I think that's a good position to have in the market. There's too much, there's, there's too much competition at the bottom. Aim for the top. I think that's, that's a much better way to do it. Sure. Sure. Uh, and I found that too, that, you know, it was, I, I would put it that way. It was a show that seemed to emphasize a lot more smaller handmade boutique builders than mass production. Mm. You know, uh, it just, you know, the people I would run into like a tsunami who I'm with, uh, one guy makes all those cables. Like he hand really? <laughs> makes the cables, you know, he's meticulous about them, puts them together. Uh, arachnid cabinets, the guy, one guy builds that stuff. He's meticulous about putting it together. Uh, I went to like game changer audio who makes these really wild and interesting, uh, pedals and things. And, you know, this, this one guy with a couple helpers building stuff, uh, Another company I really like, uh, DSM Noisemaker uh, at slash Humboldt. They're like two companies merged. It's two main guys, and they have some other people helping them build boards. But, you know, it's like they're doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I love that idea. Yeah. You know, I, I think to me, this is some of what I've been bitching and complaining about is just this homogenization of everything. And when I went to a show where there's less of it, but I saw much more interesting things. Mm -hmm. uh, then that kind of gave me some hope of like, uh, you know, it cleared enough of the bullshit noise that I could go, oh, there they are. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sitting here going, you know, where is this stuff? And it's so overshadowed by everybody else and you can't, you know, their booth is obscured or things like that. And I would say I found more stuff that I was interested in at this NAM than I have in a long time either. So, you know, yeah, just uh, innovation, interesting stuff. Uh, and I, I can't think of too many things where I walked by and went, ah, this crap again. <laughs> it may not be a take on something that I liked, but everybody I walked by, I was like, huh, that's kind of wild, you know? That is reassuring. And, and I, I feel like I, I had said, I, I contradicted myself a little bit where the barrier to entry for beginners has never been lower. Great. That's good. But then for people like you or me who want good quality gear, it, it's harder to find in this sea of mash produced gear. Um, and then I don't know about you, but for me, it's harder to find the right price point for an item I'm looking for. And like I said, having boutique gear is fine and you can charge whatever you want for it, but it might not be in my personal budget. So if, if there's, I guess it's sort of like stretching that boutique to, to fill the middle would be nice rather than pulling up the, the trash, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it sounds like there's more of an emergence or an emerging market of these boutique manufacturers that are finding ways to, to, to take up that need. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, what you're saying about, you know, the cheap overseas stuff and everything to, it does play into this because, you know, we get spoiled at a certain point and, 
you know, it, it's the, because it widens that gap of, you know, crap to high quality stuff. Mm. So when you can get something so cheap, you see this sudden huge void where it didn't used to quite be that way. It was like, here's the entrance point, you know, say like you're at like $200 for a pedal and then the boutique is six. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's like a hundred dollars for the pedal and the boutique is six. It's like, oh, well, it makes it seem like the price is so much more outrageous. Uh, you know, like I've pissed off a number of people when I keep hearing people complaining about what they're getting for a thousand dollars. In guitars, I'm like, you have no concept of what the no. history of guitar <laughs> pricing is. You want a goddamn Ferrari for two hundred dollars? <laughs> it's a it, it, you know, when, it, when I first started playing, if I could have gotten this type of stuff for under a thousand dollars, Jesus, I, I would have wallpapered my house with bases. <laughs> I, I, I mean, and, you know, pre-inflation, all this other stuff. I remember, you know, a couple decades back, if you wanted a really high end guitar, you were still looking up or two, almost three grand. Mm. And you're sitting here complaining about this. Come on, we're, we're spoiled, man. Yeah. And the other thing is, is I think we've gotten too used to disposability. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, well, I'll just buy this and it'll be okay for a while and I can flip it and I'll just do this or this. And it's like, it no, quality gear is stuff you invest in. And then you use it. You know, it becomes your thing. But yeah, so, and but that's why boutique is also something that it's for more experienced players. Mm-hmm. You know, you've whittled down what you like and yeah, you may buy an expensive cabinet, but it's like, you know, this, this may be a cabinet you use the rest of your career. It's mm. your sound now. Yes. And I think there's a little bit of gear and maturity out of that too. Like a lot of these guys I see, you know, on these forums and stuff. Oh, it costs this, it costs that. Yeah. You live in your bedroom playing guitar. <laughs> this isn't for you. You know, they want these awesome custom made this, that, and the other. And I'm amazed I see guys, you know, who've never played a show in their life with $4,000 guitars. Like, the hell? why? That's like me owning a drag racing car or something and having <laughs> it in my driveway. It, what do you, why would you spend your money on this? These are the type of people that say, oh, I'd buy it if they knock off $500. Like, yeah. No, you wouldn't. Fuck right. off. You wouldn't. <laughs> or the funny thing is, like, three months later, the best guitar they've ever owned is now up for sale on, you know, Facebook mm -hmm. Marketplace or something. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that, it, I think that delineation needs to be made better now. And I think it's going to start to be again. But yeah, it was real interesting seeing you know, what the marketplace was responding to and where the innovation was coming, you know? It seems much more mature. That's interesting. Uh, um, just trying to wrap my head around it. I haven't really, I've, okay, I've only been to one base convention in the UK. And when I was there, it felt like a bunch of tire kickers. It didn't feel like an industry thing. And it's, it was, um, it's the, the base convention so it's hardly nam it's hardly about buyers meeting up with sellers and that sort of thing it does feel like an exhibition where hey look what's on sale this year so it might be different in terms of uh, the culture um but again it just it feels strange to hear that it, it feels mature and people it's aimed at professionals and trades people i'm just trying to get my head around that that's that just sounds as you said promising mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm just sort of wondering what direction that is taking the music industry. Um, so it feels like it's catering more to the professionals and not the people in their bedrooms. So no one making music at home, but people on the road, people in studios, people actually making the profitable music, you know, on the radio or something. I don't know as much about that. I mean, especially with the emphasis on pedals, you know, everything being miniaturized. That's a very home studio type of thing. So it could be much more for that, but I, I thought it was less about, I'm going to say, that type of angle than it was individuality. 
Mm -hmm. that people trying to separate themselves from the herd. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that I saw was people going, you know, I'm going to try this combination. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to make this weird body shape. I'm going to do, you know, th that the people who were willing to put themselves out there and pony up were the ones who had the balls to do something different to begin with. Yeah. So, you know, that was pretty encouraging to see, you know, things like that. And it felt much more like, the places that were there were the people running it and the people at the booths were more artistically inclined than the usual business person I run into. Yeah. 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 It was less about, you know, well, this is our thing. And you know, here's the overview and our guy can show you this or, you know, and we're at a price point of this. And it was, I got a sales pitch way less than I got a, Oh yeah, this is really cool. You want to try this out? Yeah, we tried this idea and we wanted to pack this into here. It was like somebody was into what they were doing. And it was more like meeting the guy who really enjoyed making it mm -hmm. than the guy who was trying to sell it to you. That is so refreshing. And I'm, I'm entirely jealous of your experience because for me, I've never, I've never really had that... Um, I guess that, that experience of, of speaking to a creator has always been a salesperson, a sales rep, someone working in a shop, mm -hmm. no one directly involved with the product. Uh, and in my experience, there's always been this disconnect between the artist, if you were to call me an artist, the player, and the people who make their gear. There's always money in the middle, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, very... Jealous of your, well, okay, envious of your experience. Jealousy is a horrible trait, so envious of your experience. Um, I also wanted to touch on, did you say that there was um, someone with graphite bases there? Yeah. Uh, and again, I found that really interesting. Uh, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing the name right, uh, but it's spelled K-L-O-S. I believe it's Kloss. Mm -hmm. uh instruments and it seems like up until now they've been kind of concentrating on being like a travel instrument thing uh with using carbon as a way to be somewhat immune to temperature that type of thing uh but they're breaking into uh, a bigger base market and they had a model on display that had you could get it in different iterations and combinations and uh they'll be sending me out something so That'll be on the channel here soon too. But uh, anybody who's on my channel knows like I'm absolutely fanatical about carbon and graphite. <laughs> uh, I love what it does for a neck. And the problem is that not a lot of people are doing it. And the ones who are doing it, it you know, they've become so boutique that, you know, it does become absurd prices that, you know, you have like status is doing it, mo uh, modulus, G Gould, and you know base starting prices minimum are like 3500 bucks for these things mm -hmm. and it's like if that's where i'm starting that's a tough haul yeah you know, just because of a carbon fiber neck uh that's why people are you know i feel like i let the cat out of the bag on that kind of stuff is going back and getting these old pbs that i've uh bought up like the g base and the b quad and stuff that had modulus and carbon fiber necks in them uh yeah they uh they're doing that and from talking with them it seems like they're looking to innovate and they're going you know we really want to kind of make a mark by do addressing something uh that the market wants but combining that with what we do with graphite and i was like great <laughs> all in here um i'm just very well not surprised, but I guess intrigued because um, I think, like I said to you earlier, graphite necks have come into my attention again recently, and I've never played one, but I am absolutely fascinated by them. I think they they look and the sounds that I've heard are amazing. So I also want to try them. And like you said, it's such a high barrier to get one. It's it would be nice if that barrier comes down, but I am worried about not that the companies you've spoken about would do this, but if somebody just said, I oh, know I'll get a cheap base, 
and just throw on an expensive neck and just sort of smash the two together. I'm worried that that might be the direction of how you cut costs. I, I'm not a business person, but I don't see how you can make a good quality instrument with, you know, quality graphite neck um, without some pain in that. Sure. Well, you know, that's part of what, you know, I'm eager to check <laughs> out and everything. Um, a lot of it, it, the funny thing is it really just does come down to the neck. Um, yeah. Because even though wood prices have gone through the ceiling and everything, you know, it, we're still talking about a couple basic components. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people try and make it a lot more complicated than it is. It's like, it's a block of wood that's routed for pickups, pickups, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the majority of the sunk cost into this is the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, and apparently they have two series where, you know, one is a, it seems standard. They actually make their own pickups too. So they have them in there or you can upgrade to another series that has, a, I think, a higher quality bridge. I don't want to quote a bunch of specs and misquote them. But, you know, higher end components overall and then like aftermarket, like maybe Fishman or, you know, EMG or something like that in uh, in the thing. So you get level two. Uh, and if I remember correctly, even their second tier model was you know under the two mark mm -hmm. so you know if you're putting out a base you know at that point with aftermarket pickups um that's made of wood and <laughs> has a graphite neck and you're pulling it in at you know for, basically 40 percent less than the cheapest competition you're off to a damn good start mm, agreed so I'm, I'm real curious, you know, uh, like I said, we had a couple conversations and I don't, you know, want to start breaking out uh, things that may or may not materialize about what they're doing or something. But uh, I'm real interested to, you know, get the base in my hands here, because like I said, I tried it at NAM, but auditioning something at NAM is damn near impossible. You just can't hear it and you're not allowed to turn up past a certain point and everything. So having them in house, uh, that'll be really cool. And I'm going to be able to compare, you know, their stock pickups, Fishman's, and then I'm going to put a set of EMGs in them and see how all that rings out. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was good stuff that I could tell so far. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to hear more graphite necks in music. It feels like it's sort of come and gone. And like I said to you before we started, the only remnants of carbon fiber necks is kind of what is what fender i, I don't know if gibson would do it but fender they put carbon fiber uh truss rods and, and rods in their necks that's the only remnants but for me i want to hear more of this that tone that you get from the graphite neck so i'm thinking like david ellison when he was using the moduluses mm -hmm. and stuff like that i want to hear that tone yeah. and i, I can't think of anyone doing that so i want to bring back graphite so i'm with you <laughs> let's do this <laughs> yeah i'm definitely interested and they again you know i got to talk with them on like two different occasions uh really cool people really interested in what they do uh we talked after the show and stuff and nerded out mega hard <laughs> on stuff so you know it's that type of thing of like it was just really interested in making something different and interesting so uh that was kind of the vibe of the show. I know you mentioned that a lot of the the makeup of, of the, the stools at NAM was predominantly pedals. And that got me kind of thinking of, of a conversation we were speaking about a little while ago. It seems like the majority, obviously it's not just metal musicians, but metal musicians are probably the biggest buyers of pedals and effects units. Why do you think that, I don't know, that, that metal leans on well i don't want to say leans on but probably takes much more influence and usage from pedals than any other genre i uh, i don't know if it's necessarily just pedals but the gear market does i mean metal takes up a big chunk of it and i think it's the fact of that because metal is seen as an art form that innovates 
that there's always the new, the better that, you know, it's that, that kind of competition thing of they want to be heavier, faster, newer, you know, it's always mm -hmm. that type of thing that the new hot shit has to keep coming out. And so it's like, oh, we're going to, you know, make this rabid sound, but we're going to put it into a pedal and then we're going to do this and that. And, uh, it's also more, you know, technically challenging things like that. So it's like, Hey, got a Mesa, but you know, that the bottom end is just complete tub and you can't tighten it up and stuff like that. Here's a Mesa Rev F, but we've taken all that crap out of it and we've put it into a pedal and it's got a boost built on. And because a lot of metal bands are at that lower level too, you know, they're like we were talking about playing the smaller places, things like that. And it's like, okay, we can make it more and more viable for you to make an investment in this and be able to tour and play. Whereas, you know, you look at other forms of music and once they have their initial investment in their gear, they're kind of done. Mm. You know, it's like once a, a country guy has, you know, his, his Fender twin and he's got his telly and it's kind of good. I mean, like what, he doesn't have a tone search going on. It's like, I have that country sound. I'm going to, I can do this. It's like, he, he doesn't have to go like, you know, I have to play speed country and this has got to be, <laughs> you know, even meaner there, there isn't that tonal complex uh, competition over other people. Uh, and because it's competitive music, you know, that, that metal is. Yeah. Yeah. So tone wise, it's going to be, you know, that too. It's like, you know, our production has to be better. Our guitar sound has to be meaner. Our vocals have to sound bigger Our, you know, that they're always going after this thing. So it's basically, you have a genre that every part of it is kind of like high end studios are with their mics. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the coveted mic closet. Oh, they came out with this new to modded, you know, U47 special thing. It's because their entire world works around pop vocals and how good they sound. So that's where they get, you know, their thing or this new board or, you know, whatever this is. Whereas the metal guys are usually the ones who, you know, they explore things musically. So they're also trying to push the envelope as far as what they can do with the gear. Um, and there's a higher turnover. You know, there, like, there, there's also a recent, a recency bias, which we see a lot in metal too. It's like, even though you know you can go back and find some of the best shit ever in gear, and I love finding that stuff. Uh, you know, old Ampeg heads that were modded by Lee Jackson and stuff <laughs> like that that just sound meaner than most, you know, uh, souped-up Marshalls and things. And you can find them for next to nothing because hey, I'm pig. Hey. Uh, but there's that thing of it's also metal leans a bit on status of your yeah band, yeah you know like if you show up again to like a you know singer songwriter thing or a country gig or something like that and you know you got a Fender Twin Telly you like nobody's going well how old is that oh that's an old sound how can I, you know <laughs> whereas you know, you show up with, you know, a, a JCM 900 at a metal gig or something and people be like, you don't even 5150? Like, what? <laughs> you know, it, it's that type of thing of like, you, you become dated uh -huh. very quickly. So, you know, having the newer and the better all the time is very much that market. So, I mean, they're selling gear to, to people who reinvest on a regular basis. So I think that's why, you know, people try and say, oh, well, you know, they cater so much to metal. It's like, well, because those guys buy shit. That's true. You know, uh, and, you know, if being seen using, you know, your dad's gear is kind of an embarrassment, then there's always going to be a new market for something, even if it's just repackaged, you know. I find, I, th I think we spoke about it before. I might be conflating another topic. But metal has always been, how fast can we go? How slow can we go? How loud can we go? How quiet can we go? And all of these like extremes exploding like a supernova or like the Big Bang. How many different directions can we go? Mm -hmm. And 
pedals, I guess, are modular to, to help achieve that. I, I can see that, but at the same time, there are plenty of metal bands which only use like a distortion pedal and that's it. So they're really boxed in themselves as, as innovators as such. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other, the other part I wanted to touch on was, it just sounds like there's a lot of posing going on. And, and I will admit there was a time when I was younger that if I saw someone with a squire or a fender, I go fender, why are you playing fender? Mm-hmm. Like, and and now I've grown up and I've sort of realized, okay, there's a place for these things. Um, but at that time, maybe that's what you're you're alluding to. Like when you're young and cocky, you're like, fuck that, you need the new shit, you need the good stuff, not not yeah. this old why are you playing granddad's bass, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh so I think, yeah, there is an element of that cockiness <laughs> in there. Well, yeah, it's that and you know, it, it's that kind of youthful arrogance of you know whatever is new is always better yeah and it and also like and i think we you know we've talked about this before and it's kind of hit a brick wall but it's always the well if you're using older gear you can't be as heavy (laughs) you know they they didn't have the stuff tuned to heavy like we have heavy now so just by looking at your gear i can tell you're not as heavy you know so uh th- there's th- i think that kind of thing too of like you get a judgment of how extreme you are based on the capabilities of your gear <laughs> you know it is true uh i i want to say you you can do that but sometimes you know if i if i just saw a band with marshals and like a tube screamer i i know what i'm gonna get um, but like you said, if, if they had a 5150 and maybe some sort of dark glass tube uh, pedal or something, I go, okay, I know what's coming up now. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a big difference between that tube screamer and dark glass. So I, I know what you mean. I don't want it to be true, but I feel like it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's really what it comes down to is it's, it's, um, the metal market is far more based on regular new consumable. Whereas, you know, uh, other industries, it's just not seen as, you know, uh, uh, that you're, you're basically always just polishing a version. I mean, if you're into gospel or worship music or something, you probably pay an offender jazz, you know, maybe a real nice one, you know, something, uh, maybe a, a Lackland or something like that. But you're playing a Fender Jazz, you mm-hmm. know, basically. Uh, so there isn't that thing of doing it. You'll see the guy, a guy show up with the same bass through his whole career. Yeah. Whereas, you know, with a metal guy, you know, you may see him year to year change from guitar to guitar. <laughs> so um, I think that, that has a lot to do with it. You know, it's just that it's a competitive music and it's one that's always trying to push the edge. So it's always wanting the new hotness to help propel. You, I, I do agree with that to a degree, but I also feel like with pedals, there's only so many, there's only so many delay pedals you can release and re, you know, modify and upgrade. Uh, do you not feel like effects pedals are basically being repackaged every year? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I think it's a little column A, little column B. I definitely see that. I mean, I've sat in AB pedals before that people swear to me are like the greatest thing ever. One of the the worst offenders of this is the uh, the boost and overdrive pedals. Mm. I've played stuff that I can, you know, left right them, and I know goddamn well. This is just a new box ba- based around a Boss SD1. Mm-hmm. It, that's it. You know, uh, or it's a, a tube screamer with just a slightly wider mid sweep. Or it, you know, all this type of crap where you can bilk people pretty good. Yeah. And that's one of those things too. I almost feel like there's a market for that too. And that how we talk about 
we talked about new genre or older genres that already existed being presented as new again because people don't remember them. There's the irony of like, here's the old stuff that they won't use because like, <laughs> oh, that's old. So they just repackage the thing and hand mm. it back to you and go like, this is the new hotness. And they're like, oh my God, <laughs> this is the best booze pedal ever. It's so clear. I'm like, yeah, it's called a, a Boss SD1. We've been using these things since about 81. <laughs> You know, Jesus Christ, it's on half of the albums whose guitar sound you swear you wouldn't imitate. That's what, I don't want to say worries me, but that's what kind of jars me with effects pedals. And I'm sure it's probably similar to, to uh, drinking beer in the US. There's a lot of craft breweries and they have these really fancy cans of artwork, beer, you know, like the craft breweries with these really cool artwork. It's the same as pedals. They are identical. They've got these crazy artworks on them and you're drawn in by the picture more than the sound. And you're drawn the same with a beer. You're drawn in by the picture on the can more than what it tastes like. I mean, lager is lager and a distortion is usually just a distortion. <laughs> and, and I feel not duped, but I feel disappointed mm. that people are trying to repackage me the same shit again. Like, I, you know, <laughs> I've got this stuff or I can get this stuff. And... I don't know whether that's just the wheels of, of the culture just getting older and younger. Do you know what I mean? Just, yeah. just it, what comes around goes around. It just, that's just how it is. Yeah, it totally. You know, that's why we see things recycle. You know, the old saying of there's nothing new under the sun, you know? No. Uh, and it's kind of like, I feel like in a way, it's just kind of a way of soothing youthful arrogance in a way of like, oh, I wouldn't use that. That's the old gear. It's like, okay, well, if I put it in a new box, will you feel okay about using it? Because it's proven itself. Shut up and take my money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've seen that one so many times. And like, I know the builder and I know exactly what he's done. He's just like, yeah, I just put this together and I've been using these forever. And they'll just almost alter it just a little bit yeah just to go i did something you know i won't uh you know mention a, a, a number of them but there there's a certain company that's extremely popular with boost pedals that also makes amps and uh yeah <laughs> uh you know you can charge three times the price if you put it in a new black on black case so <laughs> i think I could be totally wrong about this, but it feels like the only pedal that seems relatively different to me, I'm pretty sure it's dark glass. They have the, that plasma thing. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. That's relatively new, isn't it? That's a new concept. Yeah. The, well, there's like game changer audio has those plasma things in them. Those are, they were the first ones I saw use them. It was really mm. interesting. Uh, but yeah, so, I mean, there's stuff out there. But it's also the irony, too, of like people, it's what I've said about guys on talk base a lot. It's like, I why can't somebody make something new and interesting and different and innovative that looks, sounds, and plays exactly what I like I already own? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of wind up at that thing of th that's really what they want. They want to feel like they got some kind of new magic because they're bored or something, but they really don't want to change, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, yeah. And I mean, you can look at some of the builders doing it and everything, but it's like, if that's what the market wants, you know, it. Capitalism, okay. baby. Yeah. Then I can, I can put that money into something that's maybe more interesting. Mm. But, you know, there's. It was at the old P.T. Barnum thing, you know, you'll never go broke underestimating the uh, stupidity of the public. Well, I feel like that kind of wraps the current state of the art when it comes to uh, musical instruments and what's going on. NAMM show was definitely interesting. And uh, as always, there's more underneath the surface. So it was good to kind of pick it apart. But so that's going to wrap it for this one. I am... One half of your host, Rodney McG. As always, you can find me on my channel, Rodney McG. And we can be found also on YouTube if you're checking us out via streaming on all platforms at Rodney and Alfie Talk Metal. And also my co-host. That'd be me, Alfie Williams. And you can find me on YouTube by typing in 
Which base? Like the question, not the old hag. <laughs> and I guess we'll see you next time on that note. All right. Take it easy. See you on the Bye. Next.